Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this third walkthrough of the opening exhibition of Nara Rosler, New York. Uh, my name is Luis Perez Ramas, and I am the senior curatorial director of Nara Rosler. And I had the, the privilege of curating this opening exhibition, which uh, uh, reaches today uh, to its third chapter. As I explained before, this is a durational kind of exhibition. Think of a opera in five acts. Think of a theater piece in, in, in five different scenes that change, that weekly are uh, changing. And uh, the two first uh, chapters were the first one the show devoted to Antonio Diaz. The second chapter was uh, devoted to two artists, one American, Paul Ramirez Jonas, and one Brazilian, Bernard Reale, on the issue of the significance of public spaces and political moments. And you can visit those shows on the viewing room of Nara Rosler. At this third chapter of Cross Cuts, which is the title of the exhibition, is devoted to three women painters from Brazil, Cristina Canale, Karin Lambrecht, and Maria Clavin. Uh, we have the privilege of having the three of them with us today, and we'll have a conversation uh, in a few minutes. I'll make a short presentation of the show, which uh, uh, you are seeing right now, the, the installation. Uh, Cristina Canale and Karin Lambrecht have been represented by the gallery for many years, and, and Maria Clavin is a new addition uh, to the portfolio. Uh, if I might summarize, and, and uh, these kind of summarizing are always too schematic and certainly unfair, uh, I think the, 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 uh, the exhibition allows us to have uh, a glimpse to the very uh, rich, richness and complexity of the contemporary painting scene in Brazil. Uh, Cristina Canale and Karin Lambrecht were part of a landmark exhibition and sometimes they are referred as, 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 as participants of that moment in the early 80s, an exhibition that took place at the uh, art school in Parque Latte in Rio de Janeiro uh, that is known the 80s generation. But I might say that the painting 80s generation in Brazil is much uh, interesting and complex and rich than some of those other 80s uh, painting scenes in the world. Uh, Maria Clavin uh, is, as I said, a new addition to the portfolio uh, and, uh, and a more recent trained painter. Cristina Canales painting, I, I, I understand her, her work as fundamentally uh, scenic, iconic kind of painting. And uh, something that is interesting is the way we have here three unique approaches to painting uh, and three unique approaches to painting that are also addressing what I would say are three institutions of painting, uh, portraiture, landscape, and abstraction. But in their uniqueness, in their very unique specificity, I would say that Cristina Canale tends to be, to me, and this is just a matter of opinion and judgment, probably subjective judgment, a painter that goes towards iconic, scenic production of images. Uh, much of her work is done through planes, superimpositions, and the masterful playing out of back, backgrounds and, and figures, back, backgrounds and figures that are stressly iconic. Uh, if I think of Cristina Ganales' work since the 90s to today, I would say that she has gone through a process of zooming out in a way that the paintings in the 90s were all over figurations of icons, like zooming in figures, flowers, uh, uh, all over compositional configurations. And that in this process of zooming out, she's been uh, going towards a more scenic and, and to, towards more, is a, is, I might say, an architectural take on the production of painting scenes. Uh, Karin Lambrecht uh, is mostly an abstract painter. She has also 
practiced uh, uh, other mediums like installation and drawing and, and drawings, installations and, and three-dimensional installations uh, with the sculpture and the addition of objects. Uh, but she, she is today uh, a painter that works uh, through a kind of atmospheric density, uh, the layer of, of transparencies and opacities in big fields of color with the uh, inclusion of words sometimes and very often uh, uh, within the field of painting. In the, in the case of Maria Clavina, I see uh, a gestural scen scenic kind of painting to, to differentiate her to the kind of iconic, this kind of architectural, structural, iconic presence that I see in, in Cristina Canales' work. Uh, what what uh, takes me in Maria Clavin's is this kind of masterful fluidity of pigments that goes through a fusion between figures and background, but those backgrounds tend to be also uh, monochrome densities of tones and tonal, figural, gestural kind of uh, scenic form of painting. Both Karin Lambrecht and Christina Canale, uh, at some point in their career, uh, were linked or are linked to Germany. Uh, Christina Canale went to Germany in the 90s, where she was trained uh, under the guidance of the great conceptual artist Jan Dibbets. Uh, if I am not wrong, Karin was in Germany studying at the University of the Arts in Berlin in the late 70s and the 80s, and she witness at that moment the, the paramount presence and, and, and kind of complex paramount presence of someone like Joseph Beuys. Uh, Maria Glavin was trained in New York at the Art School, New York, Arts, uh, New York Art School League, and in London at the St. Martin's University of the Arts. And interestingly, she began her career as a photographer and as a video artist. And I think that is something that somehow uh, had uh, uh, an inflection in the way she takes painting, in the way she addresses painting, uh, through the production of these everyday scenes that are you know, sometimes uh, uh, presented in very large monumental scales or in very, very small uh, uh, canvases uh, as a kind of mnemonic uh, uh, composition based on everyday experiences. Uh, what and, and again, I, I, I excuse myself, and not only to, to my friends, Christina, Karin, and, and Maria, for this uh, schematic and certainly unfair summarizing of, her, of, of their works, but I think it's interesting for the audience, especially the American audience who might not be familiar with uh, your work, to get a little bit of a hint uh, by this, this improvised uh, curator architect here. Uh, but then uh, what I think we can do is we can have a conversation about these works, specifically about these works, and about painting. Uh, I recall the late Hubert Damisch, uh, uh, who was one of the great uh, uh, writers and critiques on painting, and probably one of the art historians who more relevantly wrote on painting uh, uh, at the end of the 20th century, saying, and repeating and, and going back to this idea uh, in, his, in his late years that if painting has a purpose, to the extent that painting has a purpose, it should be to rebuild ceaselessly, time and again, the field to which it belongs. But that field, this idea that painting has to rebuild ceaselessly the field to which it belongs, has to do with the constant and sometimes tiresome discussion about the end of painting that never ends. Uh, but the, what interests me about that, uh, that idea that painting has to constantly rebuild the field to which it belongs is that that field can be understood twofold. The field to which painting belongs is, of course, the form of painting, uh, painting's form, uh, the, the picture, the canvas, Le tableau, el cuadro, painting itself as a form. But, but it can also be understood as something that goes beyond the form of painting, the action of painting, the activity of painting, the function of painting, painting's activity, 
the painterly function. And once you realize that that goes beyond the form of painting, beyond the picture, beyond the canvas, uh, let's say, for example, that somehow painting's activity is present in Paul Charit's films, abstractions, in, in video, or in, 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 in photography, in, 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 in the F wall depiction of scenes, a very well representationally constructed depiction of scene. I remember a Jeff Wall photography uh, depicting a crime scene in Toronto that the late Louis Maran used to compare with a Poussin painting, the mythological painting by Poussin, or that painter painting activity is present, let's say, in Bill Viola's video. But then once you realize that, you also realize that painting's activity is also something that goes back before the form of painting before the modern form of painting. Like for example, let's say uh, in, a, in, a, in a fresco in Pompeia depicting Medea about to kill her sons, you have this state of suspension that you will find then in Velázquez Las Meninas in, these, in, the, in the very specific figure of the painting suspending the action of painting. Or for example, uh, painting's activity is present in those uh, uh, frontal bottoms of frescoes by Fra Angelico, where, where you can see Jacques Apollo Cavan la Lettre like drippings before the dripping kind of painting would be invented like four centuries before that. So once uh, this, this idea uh, being clarified that, you know, Painting is a form, and, and it's a form that, you know, painters revisited constantly, ceaselessly, uh, that beyond the very futile discussions about the depth of painting, we have more painters today than ever in the history of humanity, uh, but also the painting's activity, that painting's function goes beyond the form of painting. I will invite my, my, my very dear and admired three painters who are in Brazil and in London and in Berlin at the same time while I am here in New York presenting the exhibition to have uh, a short conversation about their works, about these works and about painting in general. As we were saying before the camera was on about the temperature of painting, for example, uh, about uh, the metaphysical dimension of painting, which is something that is present in the Karin Lambert's uh, 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 work about the life of painting and about painting and life, which is, of course, the basic foundational uh, uh, material informing uh, painting and painter. So I will move towards a second uh, space in the gallery where we have, by the way, installed a group show with other artists represented by the gallery. And in that space, which has a table, I will sit down and, and we'll have this short conversation with Maria, Karin, and Christina. Okay. So, uh, as, as I was saying, let's uh, have a, a moment of dialogue. I am curious to listen to these magnificent three painters uh, tell us about their work. Uh, here is Cristina. How are you doing? Hi, Luis. Are you in Berlin? Yes, I'm in cold in Berlin. Berlin. Cold Berlin. Not as cold as New York, as we <laughs> Oh, yeah. So welcome, Christina. Welcome, Maria and Karin are there too. I think they are for now muted. Uh, the chief operator of this uh, uh, is Rafa in Sao Paulo. Thank you, Rafa. And thank you, Paul, who is with the camera in the uh, space of the exhibition if, if we need to focus on some of the works there. So, Christina, go. Why don't you tell us about particularly the Triangle House, uh, which is the, the work that uh, I, ch I chose for the for the exhibition, which is an amazing, beautiful painting. It's a landscape painting, but it's also very much 
uh, a painting about architecture, not, o not only because it depicts uh, the figure of, of a house. I, I would say it's a painting very much about the architecture of painting, is, if I might say. Yeah, you mean the, about the construction, no? Construction, yes, the way yeah. uh, the, the, the field is, is constructed. Uh, uh, in a, in a, it's a, again, I think, uh, uh, masterfully mixing the, the free brush strokes, but also the imposing structural presence of these lines and these planes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, I've been working, I think that this painting is something to 2014, no? Yeah. Uh, about six years ago, but since 2005, I have been working between other temps with the with the form of houses. Yes, uh, and in different ways somehow. Uh, but the meaning is, yeah, yeah. This is one for two, the, the very beginning. I think it's one of the first houses I did. It was this kind of a very a, a big form mm -hmm. which dominates the, the the square, and I, I I used to make this quite as a neutral place, mm -hmm. a white or luminous, and make a lot of mess around <laughs> the kind of dynamic you now of color and forms, um, more gesture. And the, the house was supposed to be peaceful, no? white, luminous. And I think that I use it in this uh, triangle house in the gallery. I use this kind of uh, organization, no? structure, yes. but in another way, because it's uh, more, more diag diagonals. No? Um, and sometimes also the house has a meaning of for me, as as a meaning, symbols, iconograph, iconograph mm -hmm. of uh, um, the presence of humans beings, or some kind of mystery because you don't know what's behind those walls <laughs> and construction. Something happens inside that you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, of protection, there are all all of uh, it's for me how houses forms. Uh, they had a lot of um, inspiration and 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 mm -hmm. feelings, and there are also another one is that is more new from this one that was very busy inside. It's nocturno. I think that you have the the picture there. Yeah, that is um, more busy inside, and they, yeah, I, I used to deal with houses in very. Uh, Ways. It's, it's interesting. I don't know if Rafa can show us the second image of the house exactly. Here it is. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. Here is something very interesting that I I had uh, uh, also pointed out in the triangle house that we have here in the exhibition is the way uh, the way of course painting is a is a is a plane uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but then within that plane you have like a mise and a beam of planes. Uh, Diverse elements within that wholesome flatness of painting become uh, in themselves planes of colors, which we clearly see in this painting how the structure of the house, the, the structure of this kind of uh, figural architecture is a multitude of color planes yep. that yep. are composed. And, and I think that is a, a key, a really key for your compositions. Now, in the first image we, we saw, uh, the one, the previous one, yeah. uh, you pointed out to that, and I, I, I love the paradox, is that the, 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 the central figure, which is the house, uh, a little bit off-centered, but also thematically the central figure of the painting, is all white and undefined and undetermined in their angles, whereas all the background that surrounds it, yeah. which in a, in a, in a very... I would say very strict, but also small logic would be uh, uh, secondary to that major subject. Mm -hmm. That is where we find the density. So this kind of you know tension that you produce by creating the centrality of the subject 
within a form of neutrality. Yeah. While, and at the same time, this all over beautiful saturation of, of greenish and colors uh, and, 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 and presence of, you know, uh, both fields and plains, but also uh, 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 evocations of of the of the regions and variety of, of topography and 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 uh, and, uh, and and nature, as is interesting as a, as a paradox, which which in the case of the second house is, is the opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That's true. Because in the the the, the other one, it the inside was very busy, exactly. and the surrounds were quite black, just one point of light. And in this one, it's the opposite. The contra the tension is. I work with tensions. The tension is it's the same but opposite. The yeah, house yeah. is quite white, and the, the the surrounds are more aggressive. Are more. Yeah. Yes. Something yeah. that oh or oh, something around okay, exactly. <laughs> going around here and, and and sometimes also there's also another uh, in, uh, image there that I use the house just a background a part of the scene but uh, um, composing mm -hmm. yeah just mm -hmm. making a dialogue uh, for me it was very important to have this house there. Because it makes a dialogue with the bike in the yeah. in the front uh, of the of the plane yeah. of the square, and and it's also in this diagonal, and also this feeling of um, something is going also in the background. Something is yeah. happening there. What is happening there? Also, a meaning in this figurative painting, just yeah. like a. Uh, telling, telling, telling a kind of history story, um, and has also this formal function. No? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 that's what I when I when I try to 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 to, to convey the idea that you, uh, the way I take it, it's a, it's a scenic and iconic. Is that for example in this case, the the bike, which at first glance could be something else. And the uncanniness is something interesting in your painting always, like the familiar being strange or the strange suddenly familiar. But then when you realize the presence of this bike, there is this contrapposto between the angular shape of the house in the background and the angular shape of the, of the skeleton uh, of, the, of the bike inverted. So you have <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah. the house and then, and then kind of this, this inner angle in the... In, and, and those two keys are creating the field in the sense, like potentially yeah. creating field for the entire composition. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, like, also the, the, those diagonals no? inside the house and the house itself, the ceiling is yes. always yeah. a good, a good, a very good uh, instrument to 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 make the the, the dynamic of the architecture, no? the construction. Yeah. Uh, we have, we, as, as I say to. To, to the audience, we have here three masterful colorists, and uh, uh, critiques have abundantly gone over the fact that Christina is one of the best colorists of her generation, but Karin is also a great colorist uh, through an approach of densities and transparencies and opacities, and rather than superimposition layering, if I might, if I might indicate that, that subtlety, that subtle distinction between plain superimposition in the case of Christina and uh, layering of density, layering of transparencies and opacities in the case of Karin Lambert. Why yeah. don't we invite Karin to, I am, I am very aware of timing, Christina, but yeah, then yeah. We can all of us have a conversation at the end. Yeah, yeah. okay, see but, you later. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you stay there. Karin. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Hola great Hello. You. So Amar, tell us about Amar. I, I might say, because I, I forgot to say in the introduction that we have words here that range from 2014, which is Cristina, to 2020, and 2018, there are two the works by Maria Clavin, and 2017, this amazing, beautiful, uh, complex painting by Karen Lambrich that is titled Amar, and which has in the field of the painting, uh, maybe you cannot see it from there, but if Cole approaches the painting, 
uh, uh, you can see the inscription of that word as a palimpsest within the field of, of these kind of calid uh, 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 ocean of, of light and, and, and orange that is on the on the left side of the of the painting but tell us about this painting and about your work Karin. yeah <laughs> it, i don't know exactly how to begin but i will tell a short story uh, okay. i did this painting um it was this and uh, and a partner she has a partner <laughs> They are my last paintings that I did in Porto Alegre in the house where I was living since I was a child. So my mom passed away in 16 and after she passed away until, because I paint a lot of time on, on one painting. And then um, I was, this was so when I was um, beginning my move to UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, uh, I think the cross is so much in my paintings. It is related in every painting has an, another meaning. <laughs> I, I think the abstraction is more important. And uh, I don't, sometimes I don't feel the cross as a symbol, only as um, a part of the painting. Uh, but of course that they are a memory about crosses. And uh, it's not only they, I, uh, this feeling of death, because uh, it's, it's, uh, this is the reason also I like uh, the word and uh, love and amar, because mm -hmm. I think this is the way to, to get over that. It not means in our feelings. So mm -hmm. it's, not, uh, it's something that helps to go um, further. And um, so, uh, the the picture a little bit before was in the garden because uh, many people ask how it works with my work with the rain <laughs> i it's not that the rain uh, because some I, I love to paint in the garden but also mm -hmm. here in uk i have a little garden sometimes i paint in the garden mm -hmm. because i feel more free with my movements for me it's important to paint so you know <laughs> that here so with all my arm or uh, I, I need to move sometimes i think that my body is uh, similar from a dancer also this mm -hmm. is what painters need we need to move our body mm -hmm. and in the garden i feel more free uh, to move and then i let the painting in the garden uh, not because i want it it's, it's uh, a coincidence sometimes it rains and here <laughs> you can see the flowers from the trees everything goes also, I don't, I have not these things so only with art materials. What you tell at the beginning, so when I was in Berlin, I think I ha had two strong influences. One of my painting teacher, Raymond Kirke, he was so meditative. It was about paint and, and, and be meditative, uh, clean the head, uh, never go to a painting with a lot of ideas, but uh, mm -hmm. he spoke much about movement, about hand, mm -hmm. the, the hand. And, um, but then also this was the time of boys. Mm -hmm. So with boys, I saw this attract me a lot, the, the, the not artistical materials. So I think in my paintings, I, I have this, I produce my, my materials by mixing pigments, with um, acryl medium, but sometimes I use earth. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, when I put the, the copper cross, uh, the, the small copper cross, mm -hmm. uh, let me show. <laughs> Today yes. I use more the which small. Is a, which is a signature in your work. And, and just to, 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 um, uh, to help the audience to get entirely what, what uh, Karen is, is talking about. Her work is very much an inquiry about uh, uh, existential issues and sometimes religion in a very broad sense of the word. And, and sometimes I think in, the, in a very material way, that, which is that I, I am taken by what you just said about the material, in a very material way, also metaphysics. It's not a metaphysics that goes beyond materiality. It is a metaphysics that is within materiality. And I, this morning, thinking of our encounter, I 
I recall a, a phrase by a very forgotten and, 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 uh, and totally overlooked a Spanish painter, uh, Ramon Gaya, who I am uh, uh, an obsessive reader. And in a letter uh, with a Mexican poet, Tomás Segovia, they were discussing about beauty, you know, and then those beauty exist and what does beauty is, what is beauty. And th there's this beautiful thing that uh, I, I like to remember uh, often. Gaya saying, yes, beauty exists. It is beauty, it is. But it is not a value, it is a material. Hmm. And this idea that beauty is immaterial, I think beauty is a material, that beauty is materiality, it's matter, is very much in your work. And, and your work has also, well, in this case, I, 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 I almost feel like it's a singing of love. I mean, there, you see this word that kind of uh, echo itself in the painting. It's, it's written several times. Uh, underneath itself, amar, 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 uh, is, is this thinking of love. But in some of your work, there is also about, and I like the idea of dance, which probably will also address with Maria, since she was a dancer. Uh, but the, the idea that there is a ritualistic aspect in the production of painting and in the production of art, but also an inquiry about rituals, uh, from everyday rituals to very transcendent rituals uh, uh, in your work. I, I first encountered your work, well, thanks to our friend Justo Berlang, who is a great collector and a great collector of your work. And I was impressed when I saw uh, your work in, in, in this collection, but also at the 2005 Mercosul Biennial, that huge, impressive installation that included, you know, animal blood and, and draperies and wood. And I was very taken by that ritual dimension in your work. Uh, that I mo more, most lately see concentrated in the very specificity of, of field painting and, and, and superimposition of densities and, and, and this kind of feeling of oceanic, oceanic depth. Uh, also master of fully coloristic in your paintings. Thanks, Oramas. <laughs> <laughs> I go touch it. <laughs> Karin, that work that we, we saw in the garden, it's meant to be a painting, I mean, because the, the first thing that I liked in, in the, in the, that, that was, you know, that I saw there were the, the flowers. I mean, there are flowers on the, over the over the surface are those flowers uh, the, the the painting in the garden ah, yes but the flowers they fall from the tree because of the the rain this was more um maybe uh, spring season but i didn't some flowers a little bit they glue on the painting but uh, I, I it's not that i desired this so um i i put them away but you know if one or another glue, because um, they, they, I let the painting stay in the garden for a lot of time. So um, maybe one uh, one week or also one month. Maybe and then they and they glue. So so you can only see pieces, small pieces at the end. Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe nature is the best painter. Is the best colorist. I mean, our friend Kao Guimaraes says beautifully that the wind is the best sculpture. So maybe nature uh, and, and blossoming is the best painter because those flowers were almost perfectly chosen for the, reper for the chromatic repertoire of that painting. And that's a matter of chance. Those yes. flowers <laughs> fell from the trees to complete the work. <laughs> Which is an idea that I, I love the way nature in in this in the very ancient uh, signification of nature, which is physis, which is this kind of pulsion, this is impulsion that goes, uh, it is hidden and suddenly blossoms or suddenly blows or suddenly 
So in this case, blossom and falls and complete the work. Yes, I would like to be pure nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful, Robin. Well, so let's go to Maria and then with the four of us and the audience. Maria. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, welcome and thank you for being here and Thanks. thank you for your work. And, and I have to say that I am also new to your work. I mean, I visited Maria a little bit Once. more than a year ago and yeah. I was very impressed by those immense depiction of the of sea scenes of the beach and, and also by those beautiful polyptics of people walking, passing by and by the portraits that I saw in the studio. So go ahead, Maria, tell us about the nap. You know, the nap is, is that as soon as I saw that painting, I have the I have the choice between a larger one and this one, but I, I was taken because I am obsessed by depictions of subjects while they are sleeping. And that, maybe I, I, I owe that to a, a late teacher I had in France, Daniel Arras, who wrote on, on the significance of making portraiture of sleeping figures, uh, where, you know, the, the subject that is being represented does not see you. you I mean, you see him or her, but but he but he or she is sleeping. And and you know, you painting. If I might abuse with the references to go from all the repertoire of of, of you know figures that are laying down. Christ laying down, or you know, in, sarco in ancient sarcophagus figures laying down, to to those modern beautiful iconic tokens of paintings by people like Matisse or people like Raveron in the case of Venezuela, who abound with the idea of sleeping figures. Tell us about this 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 painting and also about the Mato Grosso beautiful landscape that we have in the exhibition and about your work. Yeah, no, it's very uh, curious because the two pieces that are in the show are, um, I would say, a bit atypical of my body of work. So I think that was very interesting that you picked exactly uh, pieces that I made in between larger series uh, yeah. of works. I'm always going back to the figure. And it's funny because when you came, uh, you came by the studio, you mentioned, you know, exactly what you just said about the sleeping figures. Yeah. And... It was only then that I realized that I've been painting figures my entire life and they're almost always either sleeping or reading. Yeah. And it made me think, why? Why am I always uh, painting figures that are, yes, exactly. I made these two together. This was before he fell asleep. And I guess it's because, I think it's simply because it's just less oppressive and I feel less pressured because I'm with the person uh, and I'm usually painting people that I'm very close to or mm -hmm. objects, or, you know, I'm always, um, I'm usually painting my immediate environment. And mm -hmm. I guess that's why, I mean, it's a very simple um, you know, that's very, answer it, to that. It, it, and it, I think it, we're both engaged equally in a transcendental um, practice, you yeah. know? So it makes, it puts us in the same place. Yeah, it's just- it's, uh, not, it's not that simple, Maria, I think. It's very complex. I mean, it looks simple, but when you think of, of painting someone who is sleeping, I mean, with, or, or someone who is reading, is painting someone who is absorbed in what, in his stasis, either reading as, I saw this portrait in your studio, and yeah. I was I was struck by it. I mean, I, I think it's this is a great painting. But, you know, people who are absorbed by their non-action, if you want, if I mm -hmm. might say that, reading is an action, but it's also a non-action, and sleeping mm -hmm. is a non-action, as far as we, as far as we don't enter into the sleeping world of that person. But this, this absorption of the subject matter, is is something that goes back to the very foundation of modern painting. I mean, from from Diderot to Michael Fried, the idea that painting is. Uh, a field of absorption that does not depend on an interlocution with the beholder. The idea that a painting is 
like a wall. And so you are absorbed, as you say a second ago, in this transcendent process of painting, also absorbed by what you are doing. So this kind of indifference, apparently indifference, is fundamental for the for the history, for the understanding, or for the action of modern painting. Then from there to a painting that is just a monochrome wall, like a Barney Newman or a, or, or, a, or a Jackson Pollock, you know, you have the condition of possibility of that through this depiction of Lashore. So I, I, I guess, and, you know, and each of the figures you depict in these big scenes of beach, they are mm. ignoring us. They are walking. They are giving us, you know, they are going to this to the sea, they are swimming. They're, it's, it's this multitude of, absor of absorbed people that you are looking. And for, I don't know if we have one of these images that. that uh, I, I didn't very, send them. But, but in a way, each of these, the sleeper, the nap, or the other reader are like, like, like moments that if you transform them into a multitude, you will get to these larger scenes of beach that you are working on, or you were working on at the time, the areas, or, 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 or the... Yeah. All of these, you know, the beach scenes that you are mentioning, and then the other polyptics, you know, that are very narrative, and that I usually say that I used to work on those as if I was writing a book, because it's very, I'm turned inwards, and I'm just, it's a very thermal and direct, you know, uh, way of thinking, very different from these that are from observation. Mm -hmm. And then in between these larger, you know, series that I work for three years, two, three years, I go back to a more observational uh, way of, of, it's a way of, you know, keeping a balance and maybe holding on to whatever's around me. And these two paintings that are there are exactly these moments in between uh, these other series that are, you know, completely from memory, completely turned inwards, and this, you know, the Pantanal painting, this little painting. Could we see uh, the Pantanal painting called? Yeah. The, 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 the small landscape by Maria. It's, it's an it amazing was, small painting with, with this all over of, of liquidity depicting the, the, the field of, I guess, is corn? Or? It's not corn. It's, it's a very uh -huh. wild, uh, it's a wild, typical um, Mato Grosso, vegetation. No? vegetation from the wetlands in in brazil it's a place that i was in july but this was just to illustrate that in 2020 you know this the nap and then the reader and all these portraits that i never really exhibited that i used to do in between these larger series in mm -hmm. 2020 due to the circumstances obviously i only turned outwards and i was only painting objects that surrounded me in a very okay. objective way and this little painting is one of those paintings um uh, you, you mentioned in the beginning that I started as a photographer. Mm. Well, I didn't. I, I did start as a painter and a sculptor, and you know, and and very when material you, oriented. When you were in New York, no? Yes, but this is what I'm. It's almost right. But then what happened was it was very difficult to be a painter in the. This was late '90s. You need to have. You needed to have a very very good excuse uh, to defend your painting, and it was. And also I had, you know, I struggled with, you know, how painting could be coherent and, you know, uh, it was, it was difficult. It was a lot to take. So mm -hmm. I stopped painting. I painted a lot from when I was, you know, very early on. And then when for 10 years I stopped painting and I just uh, did work in photography and video, which I also love and helped me a lot with painting. So then, you know, after 10 years, I went back to painting, realizing that it could have some relevance and it, and it could also be inserted in the history of looking, which, you know, film and photography is also a part of that history, obviously, and, and, and so many other things, you know, and literature and poetry. So I guess I only went back to painting after I kind of understood how I could relate to, you know, every other way of thinking. Yeah, and I, which, uh, which is what I was trying to convey when, when quoting Damish on the, on the activity of painting. You know, it's the activity of painting is there even before, before or beyond the canvas, before or beyond the picture, no? the way Einstein would say that uh, the, the, the modern form of montage, cinematic montage was in the works in the view of Toledo by El Greco, uh, which is an amazing uh, uh, statement by Einstein. No? But, but I also love in your work this, this kind of 
material continuity in terms of the fluidity of pigments that in the in the large scenes of, of beaches we see like a, figures are almost like a, a calligraphy of fluidity occupying the the the, the, the entire uh, dimension of the canvas and uh, in the Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso is a is a small brilliant piece about that I mean it's it's almost it's, they're almost brush strokes that dilute into into figures or figures that you know dilute into brush strokes and all them are fluid and and in, uh, interlaced in a way and and I think very much you, your composition even your large composition of landscapes uh, uh, that you you are doing recently are are also based in part in this kind of uh, material approach of, 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 of representation. No, definitely. I mean, I mean, in the end, it's, it's a material approach to representation. It's, it's all about the materiality mm -hmm. of the paint. I think in the end, painting is always about painting, yeah. but then the way you, yeah. So it's as simple as that. <laughs> it's simply painting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I think we might have some, uh, some um, time for a conversation with the audience, Rafa. If you might help me moderate that, if, if I, I, I hope that the audience have questions for these for these three wonderful uh, painters and the the masters of Brazilian painting today, uh, uh, that uh, we have the privilege of having for a short week in this space in New York, but we will have the opportunity of continuing working on their work uh, in, the, in the near future, in the future. So maybe, Rafa, you tell us, because I don't know if you guys, but I am not looking at, at no, uh, anything that, that gives me a, a sense of who are they. I mean, this is so weird. We are talking, uh, one is in Brazil, uh, 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 Christina in Berlin, Karen in London, I am in New York, but we don't know who is with us. <laughs> <laughs> who is well, with us? Yeah. <laughs> it's the solitude of painting, but uh, uh, that's uh, painting. always a multitude. The solitude <laughs> of painting is always a multitude. So I don't know if you, if one of you, Karen, Christina, my or Maria might want to add something because I was a little bit of a, a tyrannic moderator, you know, keeping the water, <laughs> looking at the water. Not tyrannic. I, no. I have taught you a little bit. <laughs> you what triggers you to start a painting? So, okay, it's a question. What triggers you to start a painting? I think we, we will need more than 10 minutes for that, but go ahead. <laughs> Maybe three hours <laughs> or three days. Or a lot. <laughs> uh, so for uh, I can say something yeah, for, a start right, a painting, for we start a painting that's not the the, the maybe why uh, I think the question is just too much more behind I mean what make us to start to painting uh, why uh, that's crazy why painting there are a lot of things to do why painting it must be a reason why painting no? Uh, sometimes it has something to do with the influences in the family or something we saw as a child or something like that. But why painting? Uh, I could be a lot of other things, uh, but I choose p painting. And yeah, then that when you choose to be a painter, then you must paint. <laughs> That's it, must painting. Uh, that's why I began. I start a new painting quite, uh, yeah. every day. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. Karin? Yeah, I think it is endless. Also, I agree with Christina. After I began, <laughs> I began really early. So I, when I was a, a kid, I liked to, to draw. My mom told me that I, I love to have pencils and then I was quiet. But then I began uh, with uh, an artist in Porto Alegre. I, I think I was 15. And I never, you know, it, it's like a hunger. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you need to go away with another and this kind of uh, searching for something that is not really clear. <laughs> of, course. of course. Yeah. That's, uh, 
But Maria, what triggers you to paint? Well, you just say I, that I guess, you were looking yeah, for the relevance of, of painting, but go ahead, go ahead. No, I guess it's uh, it makes it easier to cope with the world and, you know, the big questions. And from all the ways of thinking, I think painting is a way of thinking. I think it's mm -hmm. the one that fits better with my personality in order to understand it a bit more. I think painting reveals a lot of what surrounds you and then it makes it uh, life more bearable in a way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess it just helps me in the journey a lot and it gives me a lot of pleasure. And I think it also has to do with looking. I think looking is one of the most exciting things and the more you look, the more you see and then you get into this, it's almost like, you know, I don't know, it's something that gives a lot of pleasure. Yeah, these And also informs a lot. This, this, this experience that is easy to say, but that we never end looking at. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an action that is, I mean, I, I am, uh, does Christina uses any photography for her motifs? Yes, sometimes, most of the times, in the last times, <laughs> but not only. Sometimes I just paint uh, from ideas that I have, and then I, I begin to construct, for instance, a face. And I just began with a, with a room, and then uh, something like a hair, then somehow I need uh, a little bit more information, then, mm -hmm. uh, then I go to a photo. Uh, sometimes it's the other way around. I begin with a photo and then I just like to go out of this information and make something more abstract. Then I use photo, but not always. Uh, but I like to mix the, both information, something just like abstract uh, without uh, a photo. And I used to like photos just to make attention and those two which, which is some which makes me think Christina on so for the audience to to know that Christina has been working since probably the last two years uh, you will correct more, me more. more more than that but systematically yeah. in the production of portraits and I often think of what I would call the facial value of painting this kind of frontality of painting this capacity this potentiality of painting to come forward and 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 you know present to to yourself to you the the very power of of, of a face not necessarily mm -hmm. a face mm -hmm. of a portrait but yes. this facial potency of painting that the Greeks would call hypotheposis and and you have been working on the on the icons of yes. of, of all of all also uh -huh. yeah yeah portraits yeah. There is a question here for Karin. In terms of painting and searching, has there ever been a painting where you felt you found it? Um, I think it is. Uh, it works more in in a kind of uh, continuity. It's, a, uh, it's not something that is. Um, um, I, I, I don't, um, of course, that when I do a painting, in some moment I say this painting is ready. But it's, 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 you know, in music, so you have all these uh, characters because I think that painting is a language. Uh, and we, we know this when we go to a museum, it's, you know, we don't need the word we, 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 so. Uh, we, uh, only if you see the painting, it's a kind of language. And so I, when I paint, it's not that, of course, one painting, two paintings, three, but I think there is something in between, and in this in between, sometimes I feel in peace, you know. But uh, it's not that. Of course, I I'm happy, <laughs> so I, I'm. It's not. Uh, it's something strong inside, you know. It's an inner movement, <laughs> and uh, and sometimes, of course, it's existential. So everybody looks for something. And there is a question see, about uh, if you ever find the painting complete, uh, about the when a painting is is finished, which is a you know very ancient question uh, mm -hmm. if you're painting, like you know at the end after all these diatribes and polemics and discussions, Plinius the Elder would say that Apelles was the greatest of the painters because he was the only one who knew how to take 
off the brush from the painting, not because he he knew better how to paint, but because he knew better when to stop painting. But you know, what about ending the painting, Maria? No, that's for me. That's the the most difficult thing. I think my hardest. Uh, it really is the most difficult moment, and I tend to overwork most of my paintings. So I'm always suffering a lot because I always feel the day before it was ready and I overworked. And at the <laughs> same time, I can't keep myself from retouching it or, or looking at it. And then you start looking, so it's just, this is the trickiest question. This is uh, the most difficult thing. This portrait, that's funny because this is something I worked in a day or two and then I just left behind. It was one of those exercises, like, like I told you, in between you know, these longer series. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. so happy. I mean, what I'm trying to, to learn is really to abandon the painting. I mean, finishing is a word that I can't even process, but abandoning it, I need to, mm -hmm. you know, be brave and, and really try to step back. Otherwise it's tragic. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> very, very difficult. Beautiful, wonderful. Well, <laughs> that's always a humbling lesson. Painting is always a humbling lesson, especially, I mean, after modern painting, of, of course, you know, the way, uh, you know, the vision doesn't possess the image. The image always overwhelms the vision. And, uh, and that's the richness and the endless richness of, of painting. Uh, I was looking at today in the newspaper, uh, the, this Botticelli that was sold for, you know, I, I don't know how many millions of dollars, and they don't even know if it is a Botticelli, but, uh, I remember when I was working on the Sao Paulo Biennial, journalists asking me about the, the, the best, which are the best, the most sophisticated mediums in art. I would say painting, painting. Look at a video made in 1965. It looks like a ruin in Pompeii today. But mm -hmm. look at a painting by Botticelli made 500 years ago. It looks like fresh, like it was just painted. So. Uh, it's always this kind of humbling lesson of, of, the, of the medium of painting. But it's not only about the medium, it's, it's about all what is virtually in a painting that goes beyond, as we were saying, the form of painting. Okay, I don't know if uh, I was repeatedly told not to go over an hour, and we are arriving at an hour. So if you, each of you or one of you want to add something, uh, to have the last word and or to leave a question or to leave a comment uh, that would be great if not we will be saying goodbye to everybody and uh, you want to add something Christina, Karin, Maria yeah, but maybe next time because I think we need an hour <laughs> it was yes. like to, I would like to ask the other two painters uh, if they study the colors, or they are just intuitive, you know, because right. sometimes right. people ask me such a question, ah, do you study colors, or you are just intuitive, and I normally, for me, it is impossible to study colors, but I'd like to know if the other artists uh, used to study the color, or something like that, or just do it. Trivially, go ahead, Karin. <laughs> I don't, I don't do um, uh, a color study before, and the colors they I use in the painting, I need to, because the way I paint, I cannot change much, much the colors. So my challenge is to to try to work with these uh, colors that I choose at the beginning for this painting. Uh, so, so sometimes in the middle, I, I, I see I. Is that my thoughts are uh, lost? I think oh, the wrong colors, <laughs> but <laughs> the challenge is to go uh, with ahead with these colors. <laughs> and Maria, did you start? No, I never ever am completely intuitive, and I really don't consider myself um, a colorist. I I think it's every time is a bit wrong, and I don't really, I never really pay attention to color, and it's something I don't even acknowledge, which might be a problem. But I think I'm more, I'm a, I'm al always more focused in you know line. I think I come from drawing a lot, mm -hmm. so. Uh, but I end up using color. I think I'm, I just become. I, I think I just become closer to the tubes around me, and I start knowing them. And I don't know. It's 100% intuitive. Wonderful. 
Okay. Well, <laughs> let's leave it on the intuition, which is the magic word for yeah. art and poetics. 90%. Well, thank you very much, Christina. <laughs> thank, you, Luis. thank you, Luis. Uh, congratulations thank you. for your work. And, and again, thank you for allowing me to 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 dare to put you together and and for this this moment of conversation and thank you to the team again to Rafa Ferreira in Sao Paulo to call to everybody to the Galeria Nara Rosler in Sao Paulo and New York and of course thank you everybody who, who you who have been behind the curtain of this conversation and we don't know who you are thank you very much for your time and for your attention and thank see you, you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Luis. Bye-bye. <laughs>